Good afternoon. I am uh, Mario Small. I'm the Dean of the Social Sciences Division. It is my privilege to welcome you to the Logan Center today to celebrate the work of Eugene Fama and Lars Hansen. As you might have heard, uh, they were recipients of the 2013 uh, Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. Um, it's a rare opportunity to celebrate such a scholarship. Uh, as you might also have heard, our university has done pretty well in this particular domain. Uh, we can claim 28 Nobel laureates in economics affiliated one way or another with the university. However, this is the first time uh, in the university uh, since the award's inception in 1969 that two of our current faculty members have received the award at the same time. <laughs> this is an exciting time to study economics at the University of Chicago, as, as you well know, and you'll get even more evidence of today. Uh, but let me stop there and introduce uh, the person who will officially welcome you, uh, President Robert J. Zimmer, uh, who will offer some welcome remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Mario. Uh, we are here, of course, uh, to honor two outstanding scholars. Uh, so please, if you would just take one moment to join me in congratulating our two most recent Nobel laureates, Lars Hansen and Jean Fung. Since the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics was announced on the morning of October 14th, we have seen an outpouring of interest in and appreciation for the work of Professors Fama and Hansen. Within hours, hundreds of faculty, students, and staff gathered to celebrate the new laureates at their first post-award press conference. A news media have written extensively about the work that led to the prize, and record numbers of people have tuned in to the university's website to learn about it. Uh, emails and letters of congratulation have poured in from around the world. The greatest enthusiasm has come from within our own community, from our faculty, students, staff, and alumni. It is a fitting tribute, of course, to two internationally renowned economists. More broadly, it speaks to the distinctive pride the University of Chicago has in all its scholars and our appreciation for scholarship that can have a large impact on the world. Professors Fama and Hansen, in turn, have talked about the particular climate and culture of academic challenge at the University of Chicago and the continuous push for higher standards and greater accomplishment that help propel their work. This intense culture is at the heart of the Booth School of Business and the Economics Department and the Social Sciences Division it is renewed through initiatives such as the Becker Friedman Institute for Research and Economics, which brings together scholars across disciplines to stimulate and sharpen new ideas in economics and related areas. This culture of inquiry and the priority the university places on fostering this culture are the key factors that set the University of Chicago apart from other institutions. The opportunities to honor these Nobel Prizes and decades of work that they represent will continue up to the presentation of the awards in Stockholm and, uh, in fact, well beyond. But today, we celebrate these achievements in a way that is particularly fitting and appropriate for the University of Chicago, namely by examining the ideas that these prizes represent, illuminating them, perhaps even debating about their significance and impact in a spirit of free and open inquiry. For this opportunity, I'd like to thank our panelists. I'd like to thank all of you who have taken the time to join us today here at the Logan Center and on our webcast. This is a great occasion for all of us here at the university and the most fitting way to express our great appreciation to Professors Fama and Hansen. And with that, I will turn the floor over to the moderator of our panel, Professor Gary Becker. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to add my welcome um, to all of you here and to um, try to moderate this 
uh, distinguished panel. <laughs> I say try to moderate, because if you've dealt with these people like I have done, you know it's not easy. It's not an easy business. But I'll try to control their time. And then we'll try to get, they're, they're going to speak each for presumably around 10 minutes in turn. Then I'm going to ask each of them a question as a group, so one for one group, one for another group. And then we'll have the two empty seats will be occupied because we'll ask our two uh, new Nobel laureates to come to the stage and uh, have, say a few remarks. And if time remains, we'll have some questions from the floor. But if no time remains, let me indicate that everybody will be available after the panel is over and you can you know, talk to the panelists and, and to Gene Fama and Lars Hansen at, at that time. So let me then go on, uh, uh, just introduce very briefly each of our speakers. Jim Hackman, first speaker, uh, professor of economics in the Department of Economics, and of course, a Nobel laureate. John Heaton, a student of uh, Lars Hansen and a professor in the Booth School of Business. John Cochran at the other end, a professor in the Booth School of Business, and uh, Toby Ma Moskowitz, also a professor in the Booth School of Business. Okay, so it's a very distinguished uh, group of panelists. And let's start now. And Jim, why don't you take the floor, and I'll try to control you to 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a great opportunity for me to speak uh, at this occasion, and I, I, I hope I can make good use of it. I want to talk about Lars Hansen, who, in my opinion, is a, is a model economic scientist. Let me see if this works. Yes, there he is. Uh, <laughs> Lars is a model economic scientist who's made major uh, fundamental path-breaking contributions to economic science. And I want to be briefly review these contributions. His work embodies this vision of econometrics as a unification of theory, data, and statistics. And he applies and adopts the scientific model to learn from data, to understand the world, and to make it a better place to really understand it. So he's made fundamental contributions, which I want to review very briefly. So let me put it in context, in a typical University of Chicago context. And I'll start with a quotation from the pre-Socratic philosophers, <laughs> uh, namely the Heraclitus, who wrote, all is flux. You cannot step twice in the same stream. And this really gets at the heart of a fundamental problem of knowledge, which Lars has tackled. In a changing world, how can we predict the future, make plans, devise effective policies which had never previously been implemented, to create a scientific basis for public policy evaluation and to consider frameworks for competing theories? And we know that the world is dynamic, the economy is dynamic, and accounting for the uncertainty and for the fact that many people, including the economists, but also the people in the economy themselves, do not know its future evolution and have to make forecasts which are important. And of course, agents interact. It's not enough to simply model an agent acting in, like Robinson Crusoe in isolation. Lars Hansen has addressed these questions in a series of very influential tools. And these tools actually have much wider applicability. But nonetheless, they uh, uh, are, are important in and of their own right into tackling this problem. But let me go back to a precursor whom many may not know. And this is a very famous economist from the last century early last century, named Frank Knight. Uh, he was writing, he wrote a fundamental book uh, published in 1921, and he discussed economic dynamics and the problem of trying to deal with and understand dynamic economies. And you can read the quotation for yourself. It's a kind of enigmatic, typical Frank Knight, that the existence of a problem of knowledge depends on the future being different from the past. If we can live in a world that constantly repeats itself, there really isn't a problem. But then the question is, we have to somehow draw some regularities in order to address the question of prediction, analysis, and understanding. Well, Knight himself was writing at a time when there was very little data, modern probability theory wasn't developed, and he was very pessimistic about the possibilities of economic policy and planning. So what came into existence, and it was a very important development, partially in response to Knight and partially in response to economic problems, was a body of work led by two, the first two Nobel laureates, Ragnar Frisch and Jan Tenbergen. And if you look at this quotation here, which I won't read for you in great detail, Frisch, in the very first article in the journal Econometrica, which Lars edited, actually, and is a major journal for the profession, 
talked about econometrics as being not just statistics, not just data, not just economic theory, but the unification of those. And Lars really embodies that. And so this group of early econometricians answered Knight's question, trying to use what were called autonomous parameters, parameters that were invariant to classes of policy changes to be used to predict and assess the effects of various economic policies, including policies introduced by entrepreneurs, new financial assets, and other things into the economy. Now, of course, the early tools are very crude. But here's where Chicago, again, enters the picture in terms of its importance. There was an important body of scholars here called the Coles Commission that formalized these ideas of the early econometricians and developed it. And their motto is really Lars's motto, which is science is measurement. But also, they, they pointed out correctly that measurement without theory is not a wise guide to policy, as a lot of economic analysis after this motto was written and the group was done uh, shows uh, in, in, a, in a sorry story at times. This group of people, all at the University of Chicago at various times, played a fundamental role in organizing the theory, putting together and showing the danger of using purely empirical relationships. And these various scholars, including the, the recently departed uh, Lawrence Klein, who just died a few weeks ago, considered and showed the value of trying to look at these autonomous parameters, trying to predict and use this as a framework for analysis. Yet this group of scholars, however creative they were and however rigorous, still lacked a modern understanding of uncertainty and how to deal with the fundamental problem that Knight posed. And here another person who actually was at the University of Chicago and actually interacted strongly with many leading economists was Leonard Jeremy Savage, who was in the statistics department. Savage is actually a, a foe at one point of the work of the Coles Commission. These are the ironies of history. But he laid out a coherent, single-agent decision framework of people making decisions under uncertainty. And the early work in econometrics incorporated this, and incorporated the aspects of insurable risk, but not fundamental uncertainty. And so there was a new development in economics that again pioneered here, partly pioneered here at the University of Chicago, which is the rational expectations model of Muth and Lucas. And here, there was uncertainty truly introduced into these models so that we could start addressing the prediction problem. Agents know the model, including the distribution of shocks, but they don't know the realization of the shocks that occur. And the economist observing these did not fully, was not fully able to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to know either. And so there was a real question of inference and estimation. And again, the scholars in, in, in the original work of the early Coles group was updated by Lucas showing the danger of using purely empirical relationships to forecast policy changes. But there was, an open, there was a gap in this area. And so Lars Hansen, along with Sargent, worked out the new econometrics of this rational expectations model. This was heavily discussed in the citation two years ago in the Nobel Prize. In some sense, we can say this is Lars' second Nobel Prize, but that's another story. And, but, but nonetheless, it was a, he worked out the new econometrics of it. And he incorporated into it something that was fundamental. The key idea, and sometimes called the hallmark of rational expectations, was introducing a new form of econometrics, putting restrictions across equations that came from the way that agents were processing uncertainty. These restrictions across behavior relationships and forcing variables provided a lot of identifying power and provided economists with a much stronger framework. But nonetheless, the message was very hard. The methods were very hard and complex to apply, as Hansen and Sargent were the first to admit. And this led to a breakthrough. So here's where you see Einstein. It's not, this isn't Hansen's contribution. <laughs> but there's an anal analogous equation for Hansen. This is Hansen's E equals MC squared. For all of you who know his work, you'll recognize what this has, and the ingredients are down here. It gives a fundamental relationship in a market economy where agents are rationally processing information. And parts of this equation are known, in least ex post, you can look at what returns are on some asset. But the key idea, and a profound simplifying thing, a lot of Lars's work can be viewed as putting restrictions on this equation, where the stochastic discount factor embodies various kinds of theories, market work, and so forth. So instead of the complexity of all of the uh, previous work, now we have a simplification and a, a, a crystallization. So this fundamental equation has been, has been shown to be very important in understanding asset price movements, risk attitudes, and intertemporal economics. So asset returns are observable, but it's not true of this discount factor. And so a lot of different economic theories can be brought into this framework. 
And this framework was used creatively to distinguish among alternative theories. And this takes me to my final theme, which is basically an important, important implication of this framework. The key idea of the general, uh, the GMM method, which allowed enormous simplification in the computation and estimation of these models, was basically uh, exploitation of the fact that under full information processing, given the information set of the agent, that innovations between the expected values produced by the theory and the realized values should be uncorrelated with any data observed by the agent. And so this led to a whole line of work that exploited this in the form of orthogonality restrictions, on which we'll hear more, I'm sure. This is the famous GMN. But Lars took this framework not just as a methodological point of view, but as a point of view towards understanding and trying to look at real phenomena. And out of this, he actually produced some important empirical findings that have implications that were immediately recognized by the, uh, by the uh, Nobel Committee in its award uh, on the 14th. Hansen's application of these methods, in particular the path-breaking paper by Ken Singleton, used this GMM approach and used this framework that integrated economics, econometrics, and data to give a sharp characterization of anomalies in U.S. asset prices, including what we call in the, uh, in the profession the equity premium puzzle, uh, uh, some kind of notion that was very difficult to reconcile with traditional frameworks. And Hansen and Singleton deserve a lot of credit for pointing this out, as do others and, uh, and, and whom they cite. But uh, they, this was a major role. This finding was a major impetus for Lars's later research, and it suggests the scientist part of Lars. So instead of he simply saying that, well, people weren't rational or somehow the standard model was no good and we need to turn away from economics, what he did in a series of very important papers is consider various ways to incorporate uh, information, richer notions of preferences, richer notions of market structures, to see how these anomalies can be explained within a richer framework could be used to guide policy. So final, the final uh, extension, the final contribution of Lars was, re was uh, relaxing rational expectations. His recent work on robustness and risk-sensitive control adds to the standard rational expectations framework. In the rational expectations model, the agents themselves were pretty rational. They had a lot of knowledge. They knew a lot. But of course, when we look out around the world, there are a lot of individuals out there, including probably most people in this room, who really don't know what's going on, even the very smart people. <clears throat> and what that means is they don't know the model. They're not sure. There's a lot that's out there that they simply don't know. And the latest work, again, in the line of positive economics of saying, yes, we had some failures. Yes, we want to understand the failures. Yes, we want a theory, not a bunch of ad hoc rules, not a patch, a, a theory for this particular anomaly or another theory for that anomaly, but a framework for thinking about the data. What he has done and work with uh, Tom Sargent and on his own is integrate modern decision theory in what is called a robust control and risk sensitive control. And this is an exciting agenda which promises to go forward. So let me just conclude by saying conclude. this work is what? Minus two minutes. Minus two. Oh, that's good. I'm way ahead of <laughs> I should take another three. All right. But let me just conclude by saying that this is, this is model science. It's, it's science that's rooted in the Chicago tradition. It's basically work that actually doesn't dis dismiss economics, that goes ahead and extends it. It confronts the data, doesn't avoid it, but then it goes forward and says, what should we do next? And there are numerous applications of this. And I'm sure, I hope when Lars is here that he'll talk about the application, for example, to understand Dodd-Frank and a whole set of very practical questions that are out there on the table that are affecting the economy as we speak today where we really don't understand and we need to understand how the agents themselves don't understand in incorporating models of pricing and decision thinking. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, so let me just say a few words about Lars, just personal words. Um, and then, so I, as was noted by Gary, I, I'm a, still a student of Lars's, uh, and I count him as a, a most important friend of mine and a mentor. Um, in, in, um, I've written a few papers with him, and I've learned more in that relationship than I'm sure he's learned from me. Um, and if the hallmark, uh, I'm not sure I want to count necessarily the papers I've co-authored with him, but since Lars is there, I'll count them. But hallmark of his work is uh, a level of uh, seriousness, but also modesty when you read his papers, which I think often strikes people um, 
Lars is not always the best at marketing himself, I think. Uh, and, and you see, you read that sometimes in his paper, and that modesty, as I'll come, I think I'll come back to, is rooted in his, really his analysis, his deep understanding of the, the, the implications that can really be drawn from the data. Uh, and I think that's a tremendous hallmark uh, of Lars, both Lars's work and his writing. And I think sometimes economists, frankly, lose sight of uh, that ideal. But let me, uh, let me, uh, so Lars, you know, it was interesting. I was when uh, when I read the Nobel Prize citation on Monday morning. I'm in the dean's office of the Booth School, so Sunil had had us on like Nobel Watch, and um, so I was wondering what was Lars going to say about generalized method of moments. And uh, I, this is just a, a fantastic quote, Lars. You're you're now in marketing. Uh, <laughs> You can do something without having to do everything. And, and it's right. It's absolutely right. Something, something I'll come back to. Um, so this is what, what uh, Jim was talking about when he was referring to expectational errors um, as opposed to imposing all the restrictions that, say, would come from a, a dynamic model. So the, the example, I'm not going to write down a, a bunch of equations. Um, I, I, at large, I, did, I do know those equations, so just to assure you. But I, I want to show you some pictures uh, just to give you some sense of um, sort of the, the, the issues. And, and the one I want to use is um, the one that, that Jim referred to is in Lars's important work, early work, right around the same time as the Generalized Method of Moments paper that was in Econometrica. There's another sequence of papers with uh, Ken Singleton that really revolutionized macro finance, really a, a phenomenal path-breaking set of papers. Um, so I, the, the, in that, those papers, Lars was looking at the relationship between aggregate consumption and expenditures as a, a measure of sort of the risk in the aggregate economy and uh, financial markets. Now, now in, the, in the work, he looks at financial markets generally, stock markets, bond markets, tra trading rules, various trading rules implicit um, uh, uh, in, in the markets. But I, I'm just going to show you a plot and kind of talk about what the issues are. Um, so this is a plot of... Uh, the blue line there is it's in logarithms so that it, it doesn't have its geometric growth, which it ought to have, right? So it's in logs. It, um, there's scaled consumption, and it goes, this is based off quarterly consumption. And it's not quite exactly what Lars would have used because it, it's total consumption expenditures, would, which include durables. And so there's issues about how we think about the risks in those, given that, you know, that you can hold on to a durable for a while. But that's scaled consumption is the blue line uh, in, in real terms. And then there's the scaled total stock market return. Okay, just think about accumulating it up. And uh, so that's the total stock market uh, return. And the, the blue line is scaled just to make things match because on average the stock market's growing um, more quickly um, in this period at least than, than, than consumption. Okay, so you look at this plot and you say, well, they kind of move on average together. And that's true, right? The economies grow, the market valuation things grow. Uh, that's all true. But what's, what macroeconomists or uh, people looking at macro finance and trying to understand the relationship between the markets and the aggregate economy, you're interested in, in, in the wobbles, right? I mean, what happens when the market goes up and down? Uh, what's the relationship, and I almost made a causal statement, which I have to be careful about. What's the relationship between right, the, mar the markets and the aggregate economy? So, for example, this is, what's this? This is a financial crisis, right? Drop, big drop in the, in the stock market. You know, and in, I'll show you the returns in a minute, and that's a substantial negative return there. Um, and there we see the wobble, the downward wobble in aggregate consumption in the blue line. Um, and, uh, in, and as a measure of the impact in the aggregate economy. Of course, investments moving, all sorts of other things are moving. But what Hans and Singleton were interested in is, wait a minute, this, is, this, this relationship, for example, that we saw during the financial crisis, this relationship between the stock market and consumption tells us about risk that's in the, in the markets, right? And, and you can see there's other periods where there's wobbles, and it's, some of it's hard to see exactly how uh, strong that relationship is between these two. Now, what's this, uh, what's, again, what's the quote? The quote is, you can do something without having to do everything. So a macroeconomist um, that's trying to model this. Say people at the Federal Reserve, they have these complicated models where they try to model uh, the structure of the whole economy all at once to try to understand Fed policy. You know, to, uh, you'd have to model the pricing of the stock market in this context, right? The, the, 
how the pricing and the, the, the market shows up in consumption, what are the actual shocks, be really, really difficult to do all that at once. So at Lars's methodology really is about saying, wait, from this, these two series themselves, we can learn stuff from the lens of a model. And that's what Jim was talking about, his allusion to Einstein, right? So the, this expectational error. And really what it's about is investors are looking at this series and under rational expectations, they can understand the dynamics that produce this. And they look at the covariance, the relationship, the technically the covariance between so this blue line and the green line, and it's a measure of risk. And then they think about, well, should I be in the stock market given that risk? Well, the, that, that risk is traded off against expected returns. Now, what's the missing piece? You can kind of measure all that stuff. You can measure the covariance. You can measure the average returns. What's missing, well, is pr this preference parameter, which is risk aversion. How risk averse are people? And what Hansen and Singleton showed us is without having to understand the whole dynamics, given the series, we could identify that parameter. And that's using Lars's method of moments. Just looking at the series in the historical moments, that's in the method of moments, the historical moments to identify those parameters. Now, sometimes I think when people read that work, they'll say, well, there's this narrow focus on a parameter. And then Lars also shows us you can test the models and so on. But this parameter turns out to be really important for a lot of things. For example, when, when we're trying to understand what happens when the Federal Reserve say, changes interest rates, we expect some response from the economy. That's an elasticity, right? That, how elastic will the response, say, the, of demand be a variation in, say, interest rates, all right? So this elasticity is embedded in this risk aversion, okay, under assumptions of our preferences. So this parameter that Lars and Ken were interested in at the time was fun fundamentally important in discussions of the consumption function, and ag which led into things like aggregate demand in, the, in these models. F fundamental, um, a fundamental insight. Now, whoops, uh oh, this is where Jim. Oh, okay. So sorry. So you know, so this is just really repeating a, a few things I already said, uh, discussed. You know, again, in looking at this relationship. There's this trade-off, again, between expected returns and risk. And the observations filter through you know, the work that Lars and can do and using Lars's method of moments ideas tell us that we can extract these measures of risk aversion, elasticities that can help us be building blocks for, for more, uh, more general models and help us think about how risks get priced in the, in the economy. So what are those? You know, Really, what's going on? What's this rational expectation stuff about? It's about thinking about investors solving a dynamic model and doing it optimally. So when, when you solve first uh, dynamic model, you write down an optimization problem, what do you get? A set of first order conditions. That's what the Euler equations are, right? And it, what's happening in a dynamic world, those are expectational first order conditions. So there's the errors then that we would see as an econometrician, an economist looking at would be expectational errors. And again, the method of moments allow, gives us a way to do the, pre, pre, the estimation of preferences um, and also to do something that I think sometimes gets lost is to draw inference and confidence intervals around things. A couple more plots. So, so I showed you the level, okay, so of these series. That was consumption levels in this mar market. Now, here's a plot of the stock market return, that's the green line, right, and the consumption growth. So if you look at stock markets, you know, there's another noble, another uh, uh, economist that's been cited in the same same time, Schiller. Schiller looks at that green line, right, and says that the, there's a lot of excess volatility in the market, coming from what, what, you know, how do you know? Well, let's think about what are, you know, rational forecasts for the future cash flows for, to, this, to the stock market or to the economy. I plotted here consumption, but you could think about earnings are gonna be very similar plot. It's pretty smooth, right? I mean, the, the agri economy is really smooth, and yeah, the other stock market moves around quite dramatically. So, what one uh, another pe really important piece of work that Lars has is this uh, Ravi Jagannathan. And so, uh, Lars looked at the same thing and said, "Well, you know, I, I suppose we could draw conclusions about the green line from the blue line, but um, it really depends on." you know, exactly how is the investors perceive the green, the green line? What, what really is the right way in which investors 
think about risk. What's really the right way in which they, they, they look at information over time? To really make strong statements about is the green line rational or not? And so in his work with Jagannathan, what he did is in a, a similar line of what, you know, what can I learn without having to know everything? He said, look, let's just look at the markets and extract from, that infor from those markets inferences about how volatile would be the discount rates that underlie this. Because to, to think about stock market prices, you have to look at the whole future, your forecast of the future, but you got to somehow discount it back to today. And if that discount rate is really volatile or moving around, then you could get a line like the green line, all right? And you could also get really substantial differences in average returns. So in, in a really a very creative paper with, with Robbie Jagannathan, Lars builds, builds out this, this idea that you can extract um, implications for what the discount factor should be. And then that's been, that's been used quite, a, quite often to think about, well, do models, what kind of models would you need for investor behavior and preferences to really to truly track that over time? Okay, now, last plot. So this is a plot. Okay, I had to figure out how do I get a plot of something with me and Lars, so here it is. So in, in some recent work, Lars has been thinking about uh, robustness and um, robust decision making. And um, also this idea that um, when we're thinking about risk and when we do plots like the ones I showed you before, you know, you, we get focused a lot on, a lot on the contemporaneous movements. But maybe investors worry about what are those movements we see today meaning for the long run. I mean, they're, they're the long run. And, and they might care about the long run. And with investor preferences, I'm almost done. Uh, one more point with this. Uh, with investor preferences for robustness, they might worry about the long run in some sense. Right? In fact, if you go back and look at stock market data, and I think uh, Toby and, and or John will talk about some of these issues. Uh, that it's in Gene's work when you look at the difference between values-type portfolios versus growth type portfolio, see difference in returns. You take this long run perspective, you see differences in, in their long run exposure to shocks in the economy. And so this is a plot, in, a paper I have with Lars. That, that, that blue line there is the relationship between the long run cash flows to value versus growth. And this thing, when you look in the long run, it's moving up means it's moving with consumption strongly. This is moving well, it's moving opposite to consumption. So in finance lingo, this would say it's a hedge for the long run. That's not. So investors say, I, I view this as risky in some long run sense, this not so risky in the long run sense, and could potentially help us understand uh, some of the average, the things we see in the data. All right, so I know I have minus two, but I, am I beyond the Hequin bound? Yeah, a little bit beyond that. All right, wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. First time ever. Okay, let me. Let me, last in thing, um, let me conclude. So one thing, again, coming back to this idea that Lars is very modest in the way he writes his papers, and it's, you know, so it's, I think fundamentally, when he looks at the data and his analysis, he said, you know, measurements of these linkages and risks are difficult. And it's not just for individuals, but it's for economists as well. And again, something that gets lost. And, it, uh, and some of those recent things I've heard Lars saying are just absolutely right and, and we need to listen to. You know, what is the implication of this for things like policymaker? Policy, for policymaking, uh, simple rules and regulation may be the best way to go. So, all right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, we'll find out if I can tell time any better than my colleagues. Don't, don't you love the University of Chicago? Uh, we've spent our entire professional lives with these guys, so what are we going to do? Uh, funny stories, anecdotes, how'd you feel? Nope. Let's talk about the research. <laughs> so let's talk about Gene Fama uh, and his research. Whoops. Now it, turn, it turns out, even though I work at a business school, there we go. <laughs> In 1970, Gene uh, defined a market to be informationally efficient if prices at each moment incorporate the available information about future values. So if there's a signal that future values will be high, as, as I've drawn on the left, competitive traders will try to buy the assets. They'll bid the prices up until the prices reflect the new inf information, as I indicated in the right-hand little picture. So efficient markets is just a characterization. It says what prices in a competitive market should look like, and prices in a competitive market shouldn't be predictable. That's not a com complex theory. Um, think Darwin. Don't, don't think Einstein. 
Uh, efficiency is a really simple principle, like evolution by natural selection, which organizes and gives purpose to a vast empirical project. And Gene also went out and found a lot of finch beaks, like Darwin did. Now, now that empirical work is not easy. It's not just collecting facts. The efficient markets hypothesis has many subtle implications, and most of them very counterintuitive to practitioners, especially practitioners who want to sell you something. <clears throat> so for example, efficiency implies the trading rules, buy when the market went up yesterday, things like that shouldn't work. Now the surprising result is that when you examine them scientifically, trading rules, technical systems, market newsletters, all that stuff has essentially no power beyond that of luck to forecast stock prices. That's not a theorem, it's not an axiom, it's not a philosophy, it's not a religion. That's an empirical prediction, and it could easily have come out the other way, and sometimes it does. A second example, efficiency implies that professional managers should do no better than monkeys, at picking dar monkeys with darts at picking stocks. Now that prediction too bears out in the data after extensive investigation. And that too could have come out the other way. It should have come out the other way. <laughs> In any other field of human endeavor, seasoned professionals systematically outperform amateurs. But other fields aren't as ruthlessly competitive as financial markets are. And so for 40 years, we charge MBAs a lot of tuition to teach them that they can't make money on the markets. <laughs> a sign of intellectual honesty. <laughs> now, 43 years later, efficiency remains contentious. And you've read about that in the paper, so we should talk about it. Some of that contention reflects just a simple misunderstanding of what social scientists do. What about Warren Buffett? What about my buddy Joe here who predicted the market crash in his blog? Well, I'm sorry, data is not the plural of anecdote. And these are no more useful questions to social science than how did grandpa get to be so old even though he smokes is to medicine. <laughs> Empirical finance looks at all the managers, all the predictions tries to separate luck from ex-ante measures of skill and collects the clean data. Another part of that contention, I think, reflects simple ignorance of the definition of informational efficiency. Every field of scholarly research develops a technical terminology and often appropriates common words. And people who don't know or, or can't be bothered to look up those definitions end up saying and writing nonsense about the academic work. An informationally effic efficient market can suffer economically inefficient runs and crashes, so long as those crashes aren't predictable. An informationally efficient market can have very badly regulated banks. People who say the crash proves market are inefficient just don't know what the word efficiency means. The main prediction of efficient markets is exactly that price movements should be unpredictable. Steady profits without risk, now that would be a rejection of the theory. I once told a reporter I thought markets were pretty efficient. He quoted me as saying markets are self-regulating. Even famous academics sometimes say things like that. Now there's a fascinating story here, worthy of study by our historians, philosophers of science, and the rhetoric of science. What would have happened if Gene had used another word? What if he had called it the reflective markets hypothesis, that prices reflect information? Would we still be arguing? Well anyway, starting in the mid-1970s, Gene started looking at long-run forecasts, and I brought a graph along to illustrate. Lo and behold, you can forecast stock returns at long horizons. The blue line here is the ratio of dividends to prices. So think of that as prices upside down. It goes down in the big price booms, like the 60s and the 90s, and it goes up in the big busts, like the 70s. And it wiggles with business cycles. You can see the most recent upwiggle, that's the financial crisis and recovery. You see here the astounding volatility of stock valuations, which uh, Bob Schiller shares the Nobel Prize for pointing out. The red line here is the average return for the seven following years. So here's the message of the graph. Times of high prices relative to dividends, that's when the blue line is low, are reliably followed by seven years of low returns. Times of low prices are reliably followed by seven years of high returns. And this pattern is pervasive across markets. Stocks, bonds, foreign exchange, real estate, everywhere you look, you get the pattern. Even more surprising are the dogs that don't bark. Times of high prices are not followed by higher dividends, earnings, or profits. If we make this graph with dividends, earnings, or profits, you see nothing. You would think high prices means high expectations of, of earnings in the future. Nope, doesn't work that way. Now, do these new facts mean that markets are inefficient? No. Gene's 1970 article already emphasized you can get better returns by shouldering more risk. 
and the reward for bearing risk can vary over time and across assets. And that's how he interprets this fact. I have a quote on the bottom with his interpretation. For example, December 2008, prices fell. Expected stock returns rose. It was a bit of a buying opportunity. In Gene's interpretation, typical investors answered, yeah, yeah, I see it's a bit of a buying opportunity, but stocks are risky. The economy's falling apart. I might lose my job. I just can't take risk right now. Uh, I'm selling. Well, if so, the facts still, the efficiency is still there, but the facts imply a huge revision of our worldview. Business cycle-related variations in the risk premium, not variation in expected cash flows, accounts entirely for the volatility of stock valuations. Not many people are there are, and, and, and were the central person for both the first and second revolutions in their field. Gene was too. This view changes everything of how, what, that we do in finance and related fields from accounting to macroeconomics. Risk premiums matter. There's another possibility. Perhaps people were just irrationally optimistic in the boom and irrationally pessimistic in the, bus, in the busts. There's a third, more recent challenge. Perhaps the institutional mechanics of financial intermediation is what's causing this variation in the risk premium and variation in prices. When, when hedge funds lose money, they sell. If not enough buyers are around, prices will fall. That, that's about the institutional structure. Now, these three vastly different theories agree on the facts so far, as, as I've got on the graph here. So how do we tell them apart? Well, we don't speculate. We need models of market equilibrium, as Gene told us in 1970s. We're not here to tell stories. We're not here to, to say after the fact, why did prices go up and down? We need economic models, psychological models, institutional models that tie price fluctuations to more facts in a non-tautological way. And that's exactly what a generation of researchers like me <laughs> spend a lot of our time doing. And that's a measure of influence. It's, it's not over, and, and these facts set the agenda that, that my generation is working on. Sometimes Nobel Prize have, have, have the, the feeling of, yeah, it's all over, and, and you might get the sense here, ah, oh, finance, 40 years arguing about the same stuff. No. Financial economics is a live field. It's asking all sorts of interesting and important questions. Is the finance industry too large or too small? Why do people continue to pay active managers so much? What accounts for this monstrous amount of trading? How is it exactly that information gets reflected in prices through the trading process? Are these millisecond traders, are they helping and hurting? How prevalent are runs? Are banks regulated correctly? These ideas, I'm sorry, the ideas, the facts, the empirical methods of inf informational efficiency are still there and they guide us through these important investigations. Gene always has the bottom line for it. Look at the facts. Collect the data. Test the theory. Every time we go out and look hard, the world surprises us totally. And it will again. Okay, so uh, I was, uh, we're, we're tasked here today to talk about, uh, I'm talk, gonna talk about the research of Eugene Fama, so I'm gonna talk about it the way Fama would, which is I'm gonna start with table one, although in this case it's, it's a graph. Okay. As soon as I figure out how to get this right, there we go. Okay, so let me tell you what, the, what this graph is. I wanna to, uh, touch on a, a little bit of what uh, John Cochran was saying. As Gene pointed out in that quote, that any test of market efficiency is implicitly a joint test of the underlying uh, market equilibrium model. Okay. Now, uh, Gene, in, in, I'm going to talk about what he's been doing the last 20 years, actually. But before that, uh, Gene was influential in producing the premier tests for testing what was back then the uh, model that we thought described the world, known as the capital asset pricing model, which actually won the Nobel Prize in 1990. And Gene developed many of the tests that some of which supported uh, the capital asset pricing model, but basically the results were, were pretty flimsy. And the more he looked into it throughout his career, the more he ended up destroying it. Okay? So it, it's a little hard to see here. I'm sorry, the, the, there's, there is a 45 degree line there, but it's a little faint. But basically what I've got plotted here is on the y-axis is the actual uh, average returns of a set of portfolios. They're portfolios that range from small stocks to large stocks, as well as growth stocks to value stocks. Okay, what's a growth stock? It's a stock that has a very high market value and very little earnings, for instance, or low dividends. Okay? The idea is that the economy thinks, or markets think that those are firms that are gonna grow. Think internet stocks in the, in the mid 90s. 
Value stocks are the opposite. They have very large book values and very low market values. Okay? What you notice if you look at the y-axis is that there's big differences in average returns between small and large stocks and between value and growth stocks. I've denoted those by S and V, five being high on one dimension, one being low on the other dimension. Okay? Now we have a model that says, as Gene pointed out, that risk should explain differences in returns. That model for uh, the better part of three or four decades was the capital asset pricing model. Its risk was beta or covariance with uh, general market returns of general wealth in the economy. Notice on the x-axis, what that model says is there should be very little difference in returns, average returns between these portfolios. So you can see you get this vertical essentially looking plot when in fact what you should get is a 45 degree line. Okay? Now if you were to look at the distance between all those different uh, actual average returns and what the model says the, re the average returns ought to be, you, they would add up to something fairly large. In this case, I've just summed up the average absolute value of, they're called alphas, but they're pricing errors. Um, actually, uh, Lars Hansen's methods and generalized methods of moments tells us efficient ways to average those out that take into account how statistically reliable those different estimates are, and as well as ties them to various models. So there's lots of ways to do this. But basically, this model that we thought was true for many decades, Gene, and, along with Ken French, his longtime co author, sort of blew out of the water. Okay? Now, uh, one of the things that they noticed, though, was again, coming bit. So, what does this mean? This means either we had the right model and markets are horribly inefficient, there's ways to make money be it without taking risk, or maybe we've got the wrong model. Now, how, how do we think about this? Well, one of the things that, that Gene and Ken noticed in their work was that these pricing errors tended to move up and down at the same time. In other words, there was structure, what we call factor structure, covariance or correlation structure among these things, and that sort of looked like maybe something was missing from the model, okay? So if we take a look Oops, going backwards. They, what they did was they added an additional component uh, to, to this model. So take the simple capital asset pricing model and just add two other factors. So we've got 25 different portfolios here, but we can kind of explain them with, with three facts. Okay? And if you see here, now we've got on the x-axis, so this is now the Fama French model. The x-axis is the expected returns implied by the Fama French model, which takes into account the fact that there aren't really 25 different predictor variables here. There's really two additional ones. Okay? And they're related to the size of firms and to this growth versus value or, uh, um, or book to market ratios, other people uh, call it. And you can see here, you get this nice, much more uh, interesting 45 degree line. You get a much bigger spread in these average returns that lines up, most importantly, with the betas. So you see the equation up there. The equation here says that there's not just a beta with respect, a covariance in other words, with respect to the market, but there's covariation with these other factors as well. Okay? Now, what does all this mean? Well, first of all, this is an empirically motivated model. And so we're starting with the facts. What, what Gene has been doing for the last 20 years is first starting with the facts and saying, look, if there's another equilibrium model that can explain these patterns, it's gonna have structure to it. Well, we know it has structure to it. So at some level, what we've done is taken a very chaotic world and condensed it down to a pretty simple world where we've got to think about what these two additional sources of returns might be. And that's kind of a general theme that you've heard today, along with Lars Hansen's work, which is we don't have to accomplish everything. It's too difficult. We've got to break it down into digestible um, pieces that we can then discuss and talk about. So Gene and Ken, for the last 20 years, have done this empirically and, of course, tied it back to the theory as well. Now, we've had a healthy debate in financial economics as to what's driving these things. Are these related to some of the risk-based stories that people tell? So we heard about you know, the classic stochastic discount factor approach, tying things to uh, movements in the macro economy. Is that what's driving this? And this is just a proxy for that. Or are these things related to, to something else beyond the rational expectations equilibrium paradigm? But it's, it's certainly been uh, a healthy debate. Now. Um, one of the things that uh, we do in, in our field is this is just on US stocks. Okay? But if you do this um, out of sample, out of, out of sample in terms of time periods, out of sample in terms of markets and asset classes, you get this same picture, which is here I've just got a simple plot looking at equity markets. Um, I went backwards, didn't I? There we go. Um, equity markets uh, outside of the US. 
And you get the same puzzling picture, which is the standard capital asset pricing model that we thought was true for many decades just doesn't explain much what we see in the data. And if we just think about condensing things into this sort of Fama French view of the world, we can explain a lot more. Now, do we explain everything? No, of course not. But we're certainly making substantial progress. So this is what, what, what Gene's been working on in, in the last 20 years. And again, you see this robustness um, uh, out of sample as well. Now, you might be asking yourselves, OK, so all this work on trying to understand asset pricing movements, why should we care? Is, this, is it just that investment professionals ought to care about this? Is it just designed to make rich people richer? Is that the idea? Well, no, I think what people fail to understand often is just how important it is that we understand what moves prices or what is reflected in prices, okay? Going back to the market efficiency paradigm. For instance, we need to know uh, how prices are set because prices are ultimately what determines resource allocation, where we invest as an economy into productive assets. Prices are gonna determine that. For instance, they determine the cost of capital when you're borrowing to invest in a project. Different firms that face these different risks, these different exposures, will face different prices when they borrow or when they, either through equity or through debt. These are critically important. We can also use them, as, as John Cochran alluded to, to evaluating professional money managers. A money manager who is charging you high fees but really just exposing you to something that you could get very simply and very cheaply is doing a disservice to investors. In fact, market efficiency and the idea of market efficiency has spawned the whole index industry, which has been a huge, huge benefit socially to, to investors in terms of lowering fees and being transparent about how to save uh, different vehicles for saving in the economy. It's also very useful for risk return analysis to understand the exposure of either your own human capital, which is hard to measure, of course, but certainly for a firm or even for a country or a government to understand what risks in the economy people care about and how are they priced. That's a theme in both of, of uh, Lars's work and, and Gene's work as well. And then I want to conclude with another application that uses both the idea of market efficiency as well as these asset pricing models because they go hand in hand. And it's, it's, it's easy to forget that, but it's critically important. And here's an example of something that's had enormous success, not just academically, but particularly in practice. Okay? These are known as event studies. And this is actually uh, another uh, very famous paper uh, of uh, Jeans and his co-authors, which looks at the impact in markets, the, the market impact of a particular event. Okay? So the idea here, what I've got plotted here, is merger announcements, right? And the idea here is you take all merger announcements, this is from an old study, um, and you look at, notice the x-axis, that's, that's the event time. Date zero is when the announcement is made public. Prior to that, this was private information, you can see how stock prices move around. And then once it's announced, you can see what happens to the stock price. So the typical merger goes for a premium. So on average, you see Right before the announcement, the price is here. Right after the announcement, it jumps up here. But what's most important is what happens afterwards. So in some sense, initially, these event studies were done as a test of market efficiency. Well, once the news becomes public, how quickly is it incorporated into prices? Extremely quickly. These are days, remember. But if you, you can even do this now, you know, second by second if you want. And you see that there's no predictability here. Okay? But the other interesting thing about these event studies is that it can also measure what the impact is from here to here, what the market says the value of this merger ought to be. This is used throughout the legal profession. It's used to assess the impact of certain government policies. It can be used to evaluate the impact of any, uh, any type of event. Now, notice, you've got to make, again, hand in hand, you have to know what the model is, okay? Because what I've got here are the returns, what we call abnormal returns, returns adjusted for what should normally be going on. Right? What we, in, in economics, we call the, the counterfactual. In essence, what would the returns have looked like had this event not occurred? That's a difficult thing to answer, but that's what you need a model for. So both developing the asset pricing models to assess that, as well as the tools with which to value these things has become enormously important. It's a hallmark of what Gene Fama's work is, um, and it's always of outstanding quality. Stop there. Well, thanks to our panelists. You kept to the time restrictions pretty well, and you all made very interesting comments. So we only have about 15 minutes left. Let me ask one question to the, to the panelists, and then we'll get uh, 
Nobel laureates up and they can say some things. I mean, a lot of people have claimed that the financial crisis somehow showed something was wrong with many parts of economics, um, finance, competitive models, and the like. Now, John, you touched a little bit on that in your remarks, but I'd like you, all of you, if you have, uh, are willing to make some comments on this, to bring us back to the crisis and say, well, how, how do you think the theories we've had, the empirical analysis that we've had, have survived uh, the financial crisis, the housing crisis, and the like? So, John, you want to start it off, and then let's we'll see. Another who... fifteen minutes on this? <laughs> no, no, you got a few minutes. Uh, I, I think what we uh, we saw a classic run, which is a case of a uh, market that is economically inefficient, but financially, informationally efficient, because nobody could predict exactly when it's going to happen. Uh, it showed some of the weakness in the structures in our in our shadow banking system and of the previous. Uh, the pathologies of previous regulations that we're trying to trying to get around it. It's had a big influence, of course. How could an event like this not influence research? Half of uh, half of uh, half of the finance researchers now are writing paper after paper on on what happened and and how it changes things. The big institutional finance uh, um, literature has come out thinking about whether. Uh, the fact that we invest through hedge funds has a lot to do with it. And of course, rethinking regulation uh, and, and how, uh, how we should set up a financial system that is not prone to runs, I think, is, is one of the most important tasks for us to do. It doesn't have much to do with efficiency or inefficiency. Anyone else? I mean, one of the Toby? things that I, I would say as a researcher, Sometimes we like a good crisis. There are events we don't get to see in the data, right? So we can actually measure something. Don't I mean, let it go to waste. Yeah, exactly. No, and I don't, th I don't think we are. But I, you know, I, I would echo uh, John's points. I, I don't think it says anything particularly about market efficiency or the methods that uh, the Nobel Prize was given for. But I think it's a really influential data point that you know, we're going to be working on for years. And I think, you know, that, that could, I think we've learned a lot already. This is a tough way to learn, though. Yes, it is. It's a costly way, but <laughs> yeah. Let's be clear: we're not recommending this experiment be repeated. Um, so I, I, uh, I don't know if you're going to ask Lars and Gene this question. I hate to steal what Lars has been saying about this, but yeah. let me let me go, let me try to tie it back well, to good. the discussion, yeah. which is, um, you th I think sometimes you know. Um, so let's think about people do, trying to do policy making at the Fed. So they have a model and they have some parameters, and they, they frankly have to do something, so they have to have parameter estimates. Now, we forget that those parameter estimates are fragile, right? That they're, why they're fragile? First, we have to have stationary da data that repeats itself, and we have to believe the structure. And what does an event like this tell us? We don't have that structure right, right? And is that a failing of, does that reflect inefficiency in the markets? Maybe, as John was saying, <coughs> But it certainly reflects the fact that you know we don't understand everything, um, and so I think going, you know, for me as sort of looking at some of the stuff that's going on in, in economics, again, right now I think we forget that, even through the financial crisis. So we hear about all sorts of policies being espoused based on one data point, the financial crisis. And we forget that we don't we know as much as, as we do, uh, uh, don't really know that much. And we didn't know as much before. Why, do we, why, uh, why is it the, the case that all of a sudden we've been enlightened to know the exact structure of the economy? Um, so if, again, if I go back to say, for example, stuff that Lars is talking, talking oh, about. Oh good, that's inferences, what I do, good. Inferences, you know, we knew that from the work of Lars and Gene, of statistical analysis, things are fragile. We, we, we should keep that lesson going forward. If I may, though, John, you're, you're overdoing the failure of models. Uh, this data point, the sort of basic connections between asset prices and macroeconomics of the consumption theory or investment theories, is sometimes a big data point. You see how our simple models work beautifully. Consumption fell like a stone, stock prices fell like a stone. Boy, just like the model said they ought to. Yeah, I mean, Invest, cons, inf, stock prices fell like a stone, investment fell like a stone. Yeah, Boy, just like the model said they ought to. Okay, so what I meant by that <laughs> is that, you know, one, one alternative interpretation of what would happen is that, you know, we see premia, there's something that, that John would talk about with hedge funds, to see premia for, that were going to, for example, hedge funds, and maybe that's just that they were taking on risks we'd never seen before. And so, really, what I meant is that this is an event. We hadn't seen before, and so and our models were kind of designed to work on the world without, without extreme events, and maybe it's just revealing that the, some of the structure of the models really are true. But 
Jim. You want to say something? I'll, I'll make a couple of uh, remarks briefly. First of all, I don't think, if you look at the incentives of agents in the market, this is what economics would predict in many cases. Given the regulatory incentives, given the institutional incentives, I don't think we have to abandon the notion that uh, self-interested agents were trading and were responding. So I think, I think that basic idea, the kind of notion of incentives, which is a pretty basic idea to economics, holds up. And that's the way agents trade it. It could be that the institutional framework might have been different. It might have created different things. I do think, though, I'm a little less optimistic than John. I think that there is a sense that this created some challenge about integrating the financial economy and the real economy in the macro models. I think that was a challenge. I think there, there had been a sense that people had gotten a little bit complacent. You know, you look at long-term trends and you hadn't really fully integrated, especially the new financial system. So I think a lot of that was just missing and it's a challenge and it's a challenge that's beginning to be addressed. And I think in that sense we can say, well, in some quarters of economics, we were unprepared, right? And I think that is a challenge that's ongoing. And I would second what John was saying about the, about the, the notion of robustness. Like, the fact is that what Knight was talking about when he was talking about ambiguity or the fact that we, we had non-insurable risks out there, we didn't really fully incorporate that in the first round of rational expectations. I mean, introducing uncertainty was already a huge thing to do 50, 60 years ago. Putting in rational expectations was already an important step forward, but now modeling agent ignorance and understanding truly that there are kind of fundamental sources of uncertainty out there that weren't captured by other previous work is a challenge, but it's a challenge that you know, Lars has responded to, others are responding to, and I think it, it's going to point the way towards a much more successful uh, uh, economic uh, policy advice to, in, in, the, in the long run. Okay, I mean, I have a couple of comments, but I'm not going to mention them because we re really don't have a lot of time. And I'd like us now to welcome Gene and Lars up and take these empty seats and occupy them. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just make a couple of comments. I think, Gene, you're one of the few people who have been at the University of Chicago longer than I have been. Not by a long time, but by, by a, a short business. And um, I've watched you and Toby play tennis a lot. I wish I was as good as either, either of you guys, so uh, keep it up. And Lars? <laughs> Lars has been uh, uh, my next door neighbor at, at Rosenwald Hall for ever since the economics department moved in, into the building. We've had a lot of different discussions. And I think what people stress about Lars's modesty uh, is, is really true. Uh, Lars, it's very hard for Lars to say anything very positive about himself. Or about anyone else, for that matter. <laughs> he's pretty critical, um, but has high standards. And he's been a, a, a great to have in, in, in the economics department, where I'm mainly, and um, certainly to have as a neighbor. And so you, you've heard a lot of praise um, and discussion of your work. Uh, what, what do you, how do you want to respond? Gene, why don't you start? First, I want to respond to your question about financial crisis. Good. <laughs> <laughs> because looking at it as an empiricist in the past work that I've done basically says financial markets predict real activity. So I think if you look at that period, you cannot tell whether, to what extent it was caused by financial markets or to what extent financial markets were responding basically in advance to real activity the way they always do or the way they typically do. So there's lots of uncertainty in the forecast. So the, the, the challenge for economics is to explain where business cycles come from. Right. And I always chuckle when I say that because we've never been any good at that. <laughs> the we thought we, we understood it better than we did, I think. Well, the models of business cycles we have basically have stuff coming down from somewhere yeah. called shocks. Yeah. But the, where they come from, no, nobody really, really knows. And I, I don't think we're making much progress on that. Now, as John said, though, one of the side effects of all this, and it occurred in the biggest recession of all time in the 30s, was that it brings the financial system uh, down. 
And uh, there is a response to that, which I favor. It's not Dodd-Frank. It's just to make the banks have a lot more equity capital so that they are on the hook for what they do. <clears throat> OK, good. Lars? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I came into this field as a macroeconomist and a, as a macro time series person. And I guess this is back to what Gene's point is. There, the whole game has been to try to figure out um, sources of fluctuations and, and and um, the interest, uh, and within the macroeconomics community, prior to this financial crisis, it was basically argued by very prominent people that macroeconomics, was, in terms of fluctuations, was, lar was largely a solved problem. Um, we, it, was, it was presumed that you know, perturbations that would kind of show up or disturbance, turbulence that would show up in financial markets would not, sp would not really spill over all that much to, to the, uh, to the macroeconomy. And, and, and the connections maybe weren't all that critical. And for many macroeconomists, financial markets were kind of a sideshow. And I do think we now uh, are led to think about that very differently. It remains an open question as to what, what the fundamental sources are for, 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 for macroeconomic fluctuations. But um, the, uh, the interconnections to, to financial markets seem to be all the more you know, important. And so I think that's going forward. There, there's some fascinating research challenges, and it's all connected to, uh, to these issues. So for me, it's, the, it's all about kind of what's the connection between financial markets and the macroeconomy, or, or you know, what's the consequences for resource allocation in general. And, and, and I think that's just, um, uh, there's much more to be learned there, and I'm, and I'm counting on younger scholars to kind of come through for us to uh, help <laughs> us on those fronts. And the other thing, I, I, I guess I do want to kind of echo what both John and, and Jim said is, I, you know, I think our classical models of risk analysis um, kind of stretch things quite a bit. And, and I certainly agree with John's characterization that a, a key empirical finding now that we know about is that so-called risk premium look bigger in bad times than good times and, that, and, and, the, and the research for explanations of that. Well, I think part of that is it's not really fully risk in the sense of uh, how economists typically model it. And that if you stick people into really complex environments trying to cope with uncertainty, that that, 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 that that figuring out tractable ways to capture that are really critical in understanding uh, fluctuations in financial markets. Okay, well, uh, any, any panelists have anything you want to add to that? Because we're can getting... I add one? Yeah, Jim, sure, so you can I, get the last I, word. Forget the financial crisis. <laughs> I want to go back to um, where I got my philosophy of empirical work, because I think that's basically guided my whole life. I got it from Harry Roberts. And he always, he, from the very first day he worked with me, he said, don't take models seriously. They're just a way of organizing and thinking about the world. And the whole goal of empirical research is to learn something about the world. And models help you to do that. But they're all going to be rejected eventually. That's why we call them models. They're not reality. And if you take that attitude, you're much more flexible in your thinking. And you're w willing to reject the models that you've adopted in the past and move on to to new things, and I think that was very important. Harry Roberts was a longtime professor in, in the business school, now the Booth School of Business. Te I had him as a teacher, too, and he was very good. OK, now um, let, let's give the uh, panelists a, a final round of applause. And the dean of the Booth School, uh, uh, Sunil Kumar, will say some final remarks. First of all, I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for their insightful comments, the prize winners for winning the prize. <laughs> <laughs> um, and all of you for coming. I came to the the Booth School three years ago from what now I'm convinced is a lesser institution. <laughs> and I'd always wondered, what happens when somebody wins the Nobel Prize at Chicago? Now I know. We launch an inquiry. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the discussion, but the discussion is not at an end. Uh, there will be a reception in the Gidwitz lobby uh, just outside. So please stay. and. Uh, be sure to grill the panelists and the prize winners um, and get your money's worth. So thank you for coming. <laughs>